All right. All right. So um, if you guys can see my screen that I have here, uh, this is the weekly calendar that I originally laid out for you guys. Um, I believe it's listed as March 25th to April 1st. So today is April 1st. So the assignments that I want um, to discuss today, you guys will see here. Uh, today's class meeting, we're going to talk about the poem, the homework uh, to live in the borderlands. We're also going to talk about that Jose um, Oliveira's poem, Citizen Illegal, and we're going to talk about the similarities and differences in the message. We didn't get a chance to really go into connotation and denotation last week, so we'll talk about that today. Um, I've been getting emails about the journal assignment, so do you guys see there um, where it lays out what the journal assignment is? If you haven't finished the journal assignment yet, that's okay. You guys still have time um, to get that in, but this hopefully lays it out for you what needs to be done, okay? Um, another thing we're going to work on as we leave class today, for anyone who has to go early, um, there will be a short response paper that you guys are working on over the weekend and you will perhaps be working on over your spring break. So even though we will not be face to face next week, I will still have office hours set up, so if anybody has any questions or need to check in with me or the course, you'll have that option. And um, if you guys needed any help with uh, the assignments, the short paper assignments that I'm laying out um, at the end of this class, you guys can get help with that uh, as well. So again, let me reiterate, we do not have uh, scheduled face-to-face -face meetings next week. Next week is spring break. But you guys probably will still be working on um, items, so I will email you um, my Zoom information uh, for office hours, so you can still check in with me if you wanted to, okay? Um, spring break isn't quite like it used to be. We used to probably go on trips or um, really check out, but with us being at home, uh, I don't want you guys to use so much time working on art, but you will be working on our next writing assignment. So let's go ahead and dive in um, to our where we left off last class. Meeting. Now, really quickly, you guys, if you have your um, screens up and you have your volume on, if you're not speaking or not necessarily sharing at the moment, try to mute your um, screens just so it can get rid of the background noise. So whether if you're on your phone, sometimes it without you knowing it, it's picking up a lot of background um, information. So sometimes you may have to mute it and only unmute it to speak, okay? All right. Um, last thing that we talked about on uh, Monday was the reading of do people judge you based on how you speak, right? So that was our reading and I think we really had um, a good discussion but um, I wanted to pick up from there today because a lot of the information. <laughs> Look, it sounds like someone's you whispering. Mute all of us. I'm sorry, say it again. I think you should mute all of us. Oh, could I mute, mute all of you? Um, oh, I can mute you. Okay, I'm going to mute you all. Um, however, if you need to share, use chat, okay? I, I kind of don't want to silence you guys, but I understand what you're saying, Jocelyn. Okay, um, just to recap, let me recap a few things from what we discussed on Monday and the reading homework of do we judge people on the way they speak. Um, this particular text is supporting our theme on language and identity, um, where we're learning a few um, ideas about not just the use of language, such as is it good or bad English, but a lot of times how our use of language uh, puts us in positions to be judged. So the reading, um, do, you, do we judge people on the way we speak? I think collectively we did all agree that people are judged and discriminated against based on their use of language. But in that specific text, they were talking about the um, historical um, event of Trayvon Martin, uh, the court case that followed that, 
and how a, a defendant, a witness, was judged brutally, not only by the media, but by peers, based solely on how she spoke. So there were a few things we talked about, such as environment. Remember the uh, subject, she was Haitian American, so she had somewhat of an accent. Um, Haitian American's first language is French. Um, so we know there was English as a second language barrier for her there. The subject uh, that they were discussing and do we judge people based on how they speak. Uh, they also talked about how she is from Florida. And we talked about the intricacies of language as you travel from area to area. We know New York, people from New York, New Jersey, up east, they normally have an accent, a particular way that they pronounce words, they enunciate, that will be different from someone, let's say, from Chicago or Detroit, right? Um, so what I think that this particular text helped us to see that language is really multifaceted. A lot of times it is no good or bad. We talked about that. Um, sometimes it goes beyond formal or informal. Sometimes there are things that impact the language that cannot be controlled, such as uh, accent, dialect, um, and environment, right? So uh, I wanted to kind of pick up on that um, because in the text, uh, they talked also about how certain groups, right, in reading, I believe they gave them a study of uh, a text. Oh, I think I wrote this down. I remember. Hold on. Let me pull it up. Uh, they gave a particular sentence. Okay, here it is. People be thinking teenagers don't know nothing, right? Remember that that blurb from the reading? And they asked teenagers about this particular phrase. People be thinking teenagers don't know nothing. And the gentleman who um, they were asking about this particular sentence, when asked to visualize the person who states this. Do you guys remember what, what he said when asked um, who he envisions would use, would speak in the way of people be thinking teenagers don't know nothing? What do you guys remember about that? Um, I see you, Benito, go ahead. He, they, they drew a very unflattering picture of a guy in a Rice beater, I believe, yeah. who was like in the image of yelling from his porch. Yeah, exactly. People have ideas, um, preconceptions um, that they attach to language. So when the students were asked um, about the phrase, people be thinking teenagers don't know nothing, what they visualized from that language is a person in a wife beater, remember? Someone sagging their jeans, someone yelling from a porch, right? So this is the early um, understandings of connotation. So um, we are gonna view a presentation shortly about denotation and connotation, but a connotation is the emotions and imaginations that we attach to language, okay? And we see that clearly here. In um, this particular student's imagination, they view a person who speaks in this informal um, type of language, they imagine them to be, if I'm, if I'm gonna say wife beater and sagging jeans, then let's say someone who may be um, perhaps, if not black, then someone who is a minority. Um, they see someone, when I say pan sagging, I wanna attach that also to let's say youth, right? Um, another thing that uh, they pointed out, someone yelling from the porch, right? So they view, or in their imagination, when they hear this informal type of language, they are judging that person as, um, and this is just me drawing my own conclusions, someone who may uh, perhaps come from a poor background, uh, a person who may be uh, young or um, a thug. I'll throw that out there. That's another word that we add um, connotation to. Um, 
even though it's a word, it has a deeper meaning, right? So we see that in the text and what the person who uses the language is being judged on. It isn't their use of the language uh, specifically, it's what that implies. So someone who may say people be thinking teenagers don't know nothing, what that implies is you may not be educated. It may imply that you are, um, you know, rough, maybe from the fringes, maybe uh, living in projects or ghetto. There's that word ghetto. We talked about that um, on Monday as well because the language used, and I'm pulling out my book here, you guys, so that I'm making sure I quote it appropriately. But the language used, It says, here's where it got interesting. Most of the students, all of whom are black, reacted negatively to language A. They judged the African-American English speaker more harshly than, than they did the standard American speaker, which we know that to be true. Um, it says people who participated in the study felt that they were programmed to think a certain way. Language is one of those devices that we're programmed to think those who have a strong command of the language are more intelligent, um, perhaps better off versus those who do not have um, control, um, command of what I call standard language um, to be um, a little bit more, um, what should I use the word? If they're looking at one group, as being outsiders, right? They're looking at one group as being outsiders, then those who use that standard standard edited English correctly, they look at them as kind of belonging. So we include and exclude based on the use of language. Now that word ghetto, keep in mind the people who are making these distinctions are also in the same group that is being judged. Did you guys notice that? The group that is normally judged they are judging others. And that's interesting because Gloria Anzal Dua in her poem, To Live in the Borderlands, she talks about it. She talks about the fight isn't just with, um, you know, minorities and um, those outside of that group. A lot of the war is within the group. So when we talked about the um, witness in the uh, Trayvon Martin case, Rachel, I believe her name is Daniil, um, but in the case of her, these were other black uh, students from Florida who were judging her, who was talking about her as being um, ghetto or ignorant, right? People within the group judging and excluding people, um, you know, in with the same or similar background. So we see that a lot. I wanna kind of take this time to transition to uh, the presentation on connotation and denotation, because I think this will make um, a lot more sense if you guys can kind of see it um, visualized. So let me share my screen. I want to show you guys this presentation. Hold on. All right, bear with me just one second. All right, here we go. Okay. Probably about two weeks ago, I knew nothing about Zoom. Now I feel like a Zoom. Experts, let me show this to you guys. Download. All right, sorry, you guys, this is taking so long. I have like 12 or 30 screens up right now. Um, all right, here we go. And you guys let me know when you, oh, this isn't it. All right, it's a little bit slow in uploading. Okay, here it is. All right. So I'll go through the, the slides relatively quickly, but there will be um, some questions 
that I'll ask throughout uh, the process. So let me, bear with me one second. I'm gonna stop share just quickly so I can set up the slideshow. That's cool. Yes. Can you hear anything in the background? All right. I cannot hear anything okay. in the background. Just make it sure. Can you guys hear anything in my background? No. <laughs> okay. All right. I have a black screen now. Hold on. Give me one second. Oh, no. There it is. Can you guys see the PowerPoint on the screen? No. Oh, you don't see it. Oh, no. Okay. Hold on. Oh, so it's going to make me go through it this way. Okay, that's okay. It's not letting me run it and share it at the same time. All right. Let me do this. As long as you guys can see the slides, I'll, I'll, I'll work it through little by little. All right, connotation and denotation. Let's know. Let's learn something really quickly um, about the two. You guys heard me uh, quickly define connotation. Anytime we're reading, especially about language, especially about language discrimination, uh, that will mean something different um, for each person because for each person, the emotions or imagination that we um, subscribe to language, it will vary. So let's look at um, ideas of how language um, adds certain imaginations or attitudes to um, the text. It says connotation is the emotional and imaginative association surrounding a word, while denotation is the strict dictionary meaning of a word, okay? So let's say we're looking up the word skinny, okay? So let's say we're looking up the word skinny. How would you guys define skinny? Dictionary meaning of the word. Connotation. I'm sorry, say it again. Connotation. No, uh, connotation and denotation. So denotation, and here's how I tell students to memorize this. Denotation starts with a D. So think of dictionary. Denotation is the dictionary meaning of a word. So if I am defining the word uh, skinny, skinny may mean slim. Hold on, as a matter of fact, I can pull us up the di uh, dictionary meaning of a word. Um, I'm attempting to uh, illustrate a point for you guys. All right, so let's say that the um, definition of the word skinny is defined as uh, of a person or part of their body very thin. Uh, so that's the denotation of the word. That is how they um, define the word. Now let's, let's look at the connotation of the word skinny. For me, the word skinny it has negative connotation. And what I mean when I say that is, uh, oh snap, oh, I'm sorry, you guys. Um, what I mean when I say that is, growing up, hearing the word skinny, it had negative connotation. My parents would normally refer to me as skinny, meaning you need to eat, you look uh, unhealthy. Um, I come from the South, so my grandfather used to tell me often, no man wants a skinny woman. So skinny, the, even though the dictionary meaning of the word means slim, the connotation for me is a negative one. If someone calls me skinny, I'm offended, right? But that's different from someone, let's say, for instance, like my mother. If you were to call her skinny, she would kiss your feet because she has um, an emotional meaning of the word that's different. She has always struggled um, you know, with her weight, uh, she always tries diets or certain um, things to help with that. So while skinny means something negative to me, it will mean something positive to her. So that is kind of how the idea of connotation works. It is the emotional and imaginative meaning that we attach to words. Um, 
let me show you guys a, a better example of that. Attempt to share my screen again. I'm doing horrible at this, so you guys bear with me. All right, here we go. Let's try this again, guys. All right, so we know the definition, denotation, dictionary meaning, connotation, uh, emotional and imaginative meaning that we associate to a word. Look at this. Uh, you may live in a house, but we live in a home. So we know if we look up the dictionary meaning of the word house and home, um, do you all agree that they mean the same thing? Yeah. You guys mm -hmm. can kind of shout out, yeah. If you were to look up the definition of the word house and home, they are synonymous. They are defined as the same thing. But let's look at this. If you were to look up the word house in a dictionary, um, they would have the same meaning, a dwelling place. However, the speaker in the sentence above suggests that home has an additional meaning. Um, aside from the strict dictionary definition, uh, people associate the word home much different than they associate the word house, right? And I want you guys just to think about your own imaginations. When you hear the word home um, and compare it to the word house, the two mean something different in your minds. Do you guys agree with that? Yes. Yes. Um, for yes. instance, when I think of house, I think of a structure, um, a structural unit. Um, I think of, I could either think of a bungalow, I could think of a townhouse, but I'm only thinking in abstract terms, a building, a structure, etc. But when you think of home, the emotional uh, meanings we attach to home, um, it could associate things such as comfort, love, security, privacy, um, and that is different. That's not the same association that we have with house, even though those two words mean the exact same thing. Uh, let me try to explain better. So I just asked you guys, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you think of house uh, versus what comes to your mind when you think of home? Um, another example, real estate um, advertisers. A lot of times they do not say, uh, house for sale. They are aware of the connotation of the word home. So they use home in order to emotionally appeal to buyers. So they use home because they're hoping to connect with um, buyers on the comfort and the um, love that a home usually represents. All right, let me show you guys something else. Uh, connotation deals with the various feelings, images, and memories that surround a word. Um, again, although both house and home have the same denotation or dictionary meaning, home also has many connotations. And I want us to look at this. First, let's look at in terms of the word worm, and then I'm going to pull one of the words from our reading. Um, so again, um, I'm sorry, not worm, let's snake. So let's look at the denotation, which is the dictionary meaning of the word snake. A snake is a limbless reptile with a long scaly body, right? That is the dictionary meaning of the word. Now let's say that your profession is a plumber and I come to you and I use the term snake. Well now that word will have more than one meaning for you because based on your uh, profession, based on how you use a plumbing tool that they call or refer to as a snake, you wouldn't always necessarily uh, draw the conclusion that a snake would mean one thing. It would have a different meaning for someone who works in the profession of a plumber. Uh, it could also have a different meaning based on how it's used. So look at the phrase here where it says snake in the grass, right? Snake in the grass here doesn't mean a limbless reptile with a long scaly body. When we use the um, saying a snake in the grass, we normally mean a person. There's a person who's evil, a person who operates as a snake. So denotation and connotation, what I'm doing, you guys, not trying to bore you to death, but 
denotation and connotation, the way I want you to look at it is, you may have a word that may mean something um, dictionary wise, that may mean one thing, but when you apply it to, um, let's say a sentence or open it up to an audience, the audience will attach to that word whatever emotions or imaginations they have tied to it. So another example of that is when we read the text, um, do we judge people based on how they talk? Um, I have pointed out the word ghetto and I have pointed out how the word ghetto, it makes my skin crawl. I do not like that word. However, let's look at the dictionary meaning of the word ghetto. Give me one second, here we go here. And you guys can't see my screen, um, I don't think so. Can you guys see the dictionary word right now? No. Okay, okay good. So you, so you guys don't see my screen, but let me read for you um, the denotation associated with ghetto. So this is the dictionary meaning of the word. It is um, a part of city, I'm sorry, a part of a city, especially a slum area occupied by a minority group or groups. So the dictionary meaning of ghetto is it's a part of a city, um, especially a slum area that's normally occupied by a minority group. Now here's the chat, here's the um, caveat here. The minority group that historically ghettos were attached to, they were attached to um, historically Jewish living quarters. So the word ghetto denotation wise, uh, historically, it is, um, of course, having to do with where you live, a kind of a, a slum area, but the group that has uh, been associated with it has always been a Jewish group, historically. I see you raised your hand, Angela. What do you think? Um, I wanted to um, ask a question like, so how did, if it was re historically referred to Jewish, how was it, how is it now restored to as Black people now? Right now, okay, that's a good question. See, we hadn't got there um, just yet, but do you guys see how denotation-wise, what it means is completely different for how, from how it's used. Now, it does still um, relate to uh, slum area, kind of poor parts of the city, but when did it become attached to um, African Americans exclusively, like the way it is now? We know that the connotation of the word denotation, if I were to ask you guys, what do you think of when you hear the word ghetto? It wouldn't be a far stretch for you to perhaps see someone black or see someone living in a particular project or side of town. Do you guys agree with that? Yes. Okay, yes. See, that's the connotation. But technically that is not really what the word means. That's what we have attached to that word. So Angela, you asked the question, when did that happen? Um, I think it happened um, especially in the, uh, historically, in the uh, 30s and 40s during uh, the Great Migration, where a lot of um, African Americans migrated from the South to the North. And even though the North would kind of tout the um, anti-discrimination, anti-Jim Crow, they did discriminate um, against minority groups, not just African Americans, but also Asian Americans and uh, Mexican Americans and um, uh, Japanese Americans. There was this discri discrimination in place. So what they would do is they would take these minorities and they would relegate them to these, um, I don't want to say buildings, but to this part of a city that separated them from the, the majority, right? And a lot of the propaganda, pictures in magazines, they would always depict African Americans. So the association really um, came from media, um, from, um, you know, propaganda. What was always called, uh, anytime they were referring to these groups that were moving in large numbers up north, they were Black people. And they were talking about how with the rise of this group, we see a boom in ghettos. So they knew ghettos, um, definition wise was associated to Jewish quarters, but it kind of transferred then to African Americans. It was again, this part of the city slum, not taken care of by, um, you know, the city. Um, what else can I say? 
ignored, if you will, not cared for. But somehow the word ghetto has included um, African-American women. It can include hairstyles. It can include nails. It can include how a person talks, right? So you guys see how we've taken a word that has traveled past its dictionary meaning. And now really the word is based solely on imagination and um, emotions. And we did that. So we normally will attach our own meaning to a word. Let me kind of pick us back up um, on the presentation so I don't get so far off track. Um, so I, um, I use the example of the snake, but I, there's a couple of questions I want to ask you guys. So let me ask you guys um, some questions and let's see what you guys think about um, particular words. As a matter of fact, let me utilize the um, Gloria Anzaldúa poem. Um, I kind of want to bring that in. All right, let's take a look really quickly at this. Um, if I were to use the word hmm, aggressive, if I'm, if I'm using the word aggressive, um, what denotation-wise, how would you guys define the word aggressive if I were just to ask you what's the meaning of the word aggressive? What's the denotation of the word aggressive. So tell me what do you guys think. You can use the chat if you don't feel comfortable speaking out. But if we're using the word aggressive, how would we define aggressive? Rough. I heard rough. Okay, I like that. What else? Somebody who's like in your face. Okay, rough or someone in your face. Should I say confrontational, um, Benito? Yeah. Okay. Loud. Loud. Angry. Angry. I like that. Disrespectful. Disrespectful. Mean. I heard mean. All right, good. Do you guys see how your uh, definitions, they vary. So one person said rough. One said confrontational. Another said loud. Another said angry. Um, another said disrespect, another said mean. Each individual, we are attaching to that word um, either our imagination, what we see when we hear the word, um, or from our emotional, you know, recall. Um, I want to look up now the definition of the word um, aggressive, and let's see how close did we get to it. All right, so aggressive is defined as ready or likely to attack or confront. I like that. Characterized by or resulting from aggression. So ready or likely to attack or confront. Good, that is confrontational. I heard loud and rough. Angry, I can see how that fits. Mean, I can see disrespect. Okay, good. So you guys um, are there. Okay, so now let's look at this a little bit deeper. If someone referred to a girl as aggressive is that a positive or is that a negative if i'm talking about a girl and i'm referring to her just in conversation as aggressive would you take that as a good thing or a bad thing a bad thing i see bad thing right now on the other hand what if i'm talking about a guy and i'm like you know he's pretty aggressive do we um, attach that, um, I'll, I'll say this, do we look at that as a negative form as well, a negative trait in a male? No. Not so much. Yeah. What do you think, Benito? No, what do my males aggressive. think? What do you think, Daniel? Is it um, a negative thing to refer to a male as aggressive? We, we, we've agreed already that it's not um, a positive for a girl to be referred to as um, aggressive, but what about a guy? I heard some, somebody say yes. Do, does my yeah. um, male audience, do you guys agree with that? Yeah, I don't think you, like, aggressive is a hard word to use there. So if you're using the word aggressive, I think, yeah. You okay. don't want to push over, but you don't want a guy to be aggressive. Okay, I see what you're saying. Um, I can tell you this. Whether the word is aggressive, assertive, normally that word has negative connotation anytime a female is involved right? Um, sometimes that is translated to being too pushy or over the top. Well, I've seen where it is a positive for a guy to be aggressive, you know, not aggressive um, in terms of fighting or confrontational, but normally to assert himself. 
So while it's acceptable in one group, sometimes it's not always acceptable um, in another. So again, this is given um, an example of how connotation and denotation, depending on audience, the meanings we sub um, subscribe to. Here's another word. Let's, let's think about this word. What about the word sissy? S-I-S-S-Y. Um, when you guys hear the word sissy, so we're looking at connotation now, what do you think? What in your imaginative or emotional response, what comes to mind when you hear the word sissy? S-I-S-S-Y. This is a safe space, so just make sure you guys stay politically correct, but what do you think when you hear that word? Like if you're scared, if you don't want to do something. I'm sorry, say it again, Paulina. You say, um, I'm sorry, say that one more time. Like if, like if you're scared, like if you don't want to do something. Oh, okay, I see it. Okay, so sissy, as in like you're scared. Um, okay, so, okay, I see that. Okay, I'm jotting that down. Okay, good. I like it. What else? When you hear the word sissy in your imagination, what do you see? What comes to, um, what do you think of? I heard scared. What else? If you I guys. Mean, hmm? It's basically an insult. So I guess it is because they basically use it when you, when someone else is scared. Okay. Okay. So do with that one. Yeah. I see that. I can see that. Scared. Does anyone use or re or has anyone heard the word sissy used to um, or to refer to um, those who may identify as homosexual? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I know that it may be, you may not want to say it, but just to kind of be honest, right. that word a lot of times is attached negatively to um, what I sometimes and this is just from asking the question in class before men or boys who they feel act like girls so have we heard it used in that sense or does it in some cases make you think so where we say scared or weak um i think marissa said it's normally used as an insult absolutely um but it all kind of has these negative connotations right so when you hear the word sissy that's what you think of yes yes now let me tell you something about me I have, I think you guys know I'm the middle child, seven kids. When I hear the word sissy, the first meaning I associate to is my sisters. Because we refer to each other as sissy. Okay, so did anybody think of sister? It wasn't the first thought that came in your mind, right? Yeah. Okay, I see that. See, again, that's another example of connotation. The first thought that came in my mind, how that word is normally used around me is sister. That's a nickname for family or for your sister. Whereas when I've brought this up in class before, uh, my students, and it will vary, but most of them associated to an insult, a uh, negative connotation, uh, showing someone as weak, um, less than, feminine qualities, that's normally how it would it would um, be addressed in the class. But again, what I'm trying to show you guys is the changes in how language is used. Even though we may be dealing with um, the same word, how one person in your audience will take it will differ from how someone else will. So I wanted to kind of lay this out before we talk about Gloria um, Anzal Dua because um, in the poem, To Live in the Borderlands, she uses what I call loaded language. And really depending on your experience or your background, we are going to take different things from our reading of this text. So it's, it's really rich. Um, but what did you guys think about the Gloria um, Anzal Dua poem? It's relatively short. Um, we're, we've been used to reading longer essays or articles. But what do you guys think about um, this poem, especially in our discussion of language and identity. So throw that out there for me and I'll kind of set up the questions I wanted to ask. What do you guys think about the poem? Did we like it? I, I enjoyed it. I think it, um, 
I think it talked about something that I could relate to. Okay. Um, all right, good. I like that. So Benito said he liked it. He can relate to it. What did you guys think about? And it's, uh, I believe it's seven stanzas. Let me pull it up. 118. Um, I am obsessed with Gloria Anzaldúa. Um, she is a superstar in that she's one of the earliest voices who really began to um, confront and kind of take a look at language discrimination, um, as well as a multitude of other things. She uh, also kicked off queer studies in certain parts of the world. Um, she is really focused on uh, establishing individuality, right? So where a lot of times language is used to discriminate, to group people, to stereotype, um, put people in boxes, she is really pushing back and challenging that misuse, if you will, of language. So when we read, do people judge you based on how you speak? We learned people absolutely do. Uh, the question was posed, who is doing this judgment? Normally it is the majority, wherever you live, it's normally that majority group who uses things such as language, race, background, those types of things as markers of inclusion or exclusion, right? She takes direct aim at this practice, okay? That's what I like. Let me pull up um, a little bit more about Gloria Anzaldúa. Her story is unique. Um, we can tell from the poem, she has, when, when she says to live um, in the borderlands, uh, she's referring to several um, instances. Not only is she um, first generation Mexican American, uh, she calls herself a queer Chicana poet, writer, and feminist theorist. Uh, she also was discriminated a lot within uh, the Mexican culture. So because she didn't speak Spanish, let's say, well, or strong, or maybe she stumbled over some words, or she used a version of what they call Chicana uh, Spanish, where some words will be um, English, could be tied into um, you know, the way she used English. She said she was discriminated and judged from her peers, people who too were either Mexican or Mexican-American. So she kind of talks about to live in the borderlands isn't just uh, a discussion of her being discriminated against by the majority. She's talking about how she has been discriminated against by family members, um, people back home in Mexico who would put her down growing up in America and her use of Spanish. So she has a unique story to tell. I want to show it. Um, well, I did just share it with you guys, um, but I want to pull up uh, a couple of questions that I want us to consider in our discussion of this. So give me a second. All right, I got it here. I know you guys are like Miss Cole. If you just have this ready, look, I promise I had this ready. Uh, okay, here we go. All right, so I'm going to share my, um, split my screen with you one more time. Okay, here's a couple of questions for us to consider about our reading. And again, I told you guys at the start of class that um, if I don't call on you, if I don't see you, use chat to kind of really help me um, get through these questions. But okay, so why do you guys believe in this poem that the poet uses both Spanish and English? Let's let's start there. Uh, so you guys kind of see in the opening stanza. Do you guys have the poem in front of you? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Um, poetry is read differently from articles and essays. With poetry, there is normally an effort to use language as a tool. So it's, it's so fitting for this unit that we're in. But a lot of the language used in poetry will be metaphor. Um, and what metaphor is is they will either use um, a familiar or unfamiliar analogy in order to connect to or define an object. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at examples of this, but 
in reading this, I want you guys to be really mindful of the language. So why do you think the poet uses both Spanish and English? What do we think about that? And I know um, I adore Benito and he always speaks up, but I don't want Benito to carry discussion. So I want everybody, if you can, to um, either, again, speaking up or using uh -huh. chat. I want us all to try to um, contribute to this discussion. Why do you think that the poet uses both Spanish and English? Mm -hmm. I think for different audiences. Okay, I like I heard for different audiences. Okay, that sounds good. What do you um what else do we think? I think for better understandings. Okay, for better understandings. Um so or you mean like for if, different if, meanings. I'm I'm sorry, say that one more time. For different meanings. For different meanings, okay. I like that. Um, somebody said for understanding, so maybe she's aware that there may be someone in her audience who may speak Spanish. Do you guys think that's what it is? I say so. Um, the way we speak. I'm sorry, say it one more time for me. Um, I say that so we can feel free on the way we speak. Oh, I like that. So we can feel free on the way we speak. Um, if you guys, um, you know, as we get more familiar with Gloria Anzaldúa, I think that's closest to the reason why she may have used both Spanish and English. The freedom to do so. She, the way she confronted this judgment or language discrimination was by really exercising the freedom. Um, so I do think she moves in and out of Spanish and English because she has the freedom to do so. But also, um, she wants to show that in terms of bilingual, um, in terms of being bilingual, English as a second language, I think she's trying to show realistically what happens in the mind of someone where English is a second language. Do you guys agree that, um, it's, especially those of you who may speak another language other than English, or where English may be a second language, do you agree that in your mind, the way you process information, does it go through from Spanish to English? Yes. yes. Right, absolutely. And I think that one of the reasons why she's writing in both Spanish and English is she's attempting to show that she thinks in both Spanish and English. It's, it's constantly lit, um, the two languages um, are living together uh, in her mind. There is no separation. So where people who discriminate against, um, who use language discrimination, where they may want you to speak English or they may want you to kind of choose that. She's showing that's almost an unrealistic choice because she constantly maneuvers back and forth between the two, okay? Um, so I think her using both Spanish and English, she's shouting out the bilingual um, population. There, there is a bilingual population, there's a group that they always constantly move between the mother tongue and their use of English, right? Whether that's Spanish or French or um, uh, Chinese or things like that. Um, all right, um, let me... Can I say something? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, I also think it was to add to the poem because the poem's talking about being mixed. So being mixed oh, yeah. race and the blood is that. So I think it's also to add to that by showing two different languages from two different parts. Right, absolutely. Um, and you bought up, did you bring up mixed? I'm sorry, did you say mixed? Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. So she is mixed race. And we kind of see that there. And I too agree with you. I think she's bringing up the use of both Spanish and English too. She's asserting that she's not one or the other. She's asserting, I'm not just English, or I am not just, um, you know, my language, but I'm kind of a combination of the two, right? Uh, so good, I definitely see that. Um, another thing I wanted us to take a look at when we um, consider this, um, as you guys can see in that first stanza, um, when she lays out uh, the breakdown, um, to live in the borderlands means you are neither and then she kind of lays out uh, this list, right? Um, Hispana, India, Negra, Española, Nicabacha. I'm sorry if I'm butchering this, you guys. I have a 
a country accent and it has really, um, it impacts my rolling of uh, the R's and proper uh, pronunciation, just like in some cases, um, uh, you know, we see a lot with Spanish in some cases being a second language, well, definitely not a mastered second language, but you guys may not know, I took five years of Spanish in both high school, combination of high school and um, college. And even with that um, background, even with that education, it's very clear to a native speaker that I do not belong. You know what I mean? Um, so that use of language and how it's used to identify who's included or who's excluded is always at work. But early on in that first stanza where she's kind of laying out, um, she is identifying the various parts of her. So um, Benito marked um, that she's of a mixed ancestry, mixed background. She lays out each part, right? Uh, she uses the term half breed, uh, caught in the crossfire between camps while carrying all five races on your back, not knowing which side to turn to or run from. Um, so she's speaking a lot to this need to commit, pick a side, um, choose what it is you'll be. And she's saying how difficult that is when uh, to her, each part is equally important, right? So where it says, uh, question number two, reread stanza number two. So where you guys are looking at stanza number two, it begins with to live in the borderlands means knowing. So reread stanza two. Um, based on these lines, uh, how is the poet metaphorically on the border? So keep in mind, I just gave you guys some ideas about metaphor. The border is a analogy she's using um, to make a larger point. So how do you guys feel based on the lines in stanza two? You guys have a moment to reread it. How do you feel um, the poet is kind of, you know, discussing this um, the border metaphorically. What does border mean here? So reread number two and let me know, um, stanza number two, and let me know what you guys think. What does the border, what is it a metaphor for? And when I say metaphor, what does the border symbolize? What does it mean? I'm hearing you guys, what do we think? like a blockage. I'm sorry, say it one more time for me, Daniel. A blockage. Like, oh, I can't hear you as good as I want to, um, Daniel. Perhaps maybe if you guys can use um, your chat. He said a blockage. A blockage, okay. Um, so the border here is symbolizing a blockage. What do you guys think? What do we want to add to that? I I would say separation. Separation. I can see that to live in the borderlands. You know, she's playing on the the term border. I think it's like in your like in your mind, like fighting with all the different parts of you since you're a mixed race. In your mind, knowing that like this part of your heritage isn't like this part of your heritage and things like that. Okay, so the border is symbolizing then um, the various parts of your heritage or background. That's what you're saying, Benito? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the mental struggle. Oh, mental border. struggle. Okay, definitely. I can see that, where you, where, especially where you stated mental struggle of being in the board, um, on the border. I see that. What else did you guys want to add? Like maybe individual groups. Um, All right, can somebody help me out just a tad bit? I'm not, I'm not picking it up too clearly, but I think you guys are. Individual groups on separation. Sorry, you guys. I can't hear. I can't hear it that well. Oh, I see some chat. Okay, good. Um, All right, so let me just kind of throw in here. Do you guys know that a lot of times when it comes to race, 
a lot of times you're normally asked to kind of pick a box and a lot of times the box doesn't take into consideration that you may be more than let's say how a lot of times a person may be asked to uh, check the box black or white but what about if you are bi biracial what if you're both black and white where where then do you fall right you kind of fall along the border so the the term border here metaphorically means almost i think she's looking at where she's living in a world that is forcing her into boxes or categories or to kind of live on this border one or the other she is attempting to um I won't say knock down that border, attempt, maybe attempt to knock down that barrier, uh, erase the borders and um, accept or include all parts of a person. So this is really good in our discussion of language discrimination. Instead of expecting a person to speak English, be these one dimensional characters, sometimes those borders are, are blurred. Maybe a person is, um, beyond just that label so sometimes the border here uh metaphorically could mean labels it could mean categories um kind of moving beyond that but i like that she's using the term border because she's playing on um experiences that a lot of time affects uh not just immigrants i'll, I'll normally say any minority group but in this case where we're dealing with language mostly immigrants and uh she's using that word border um, as a tool. It's, it's being used as a metaphorical tool here. Um, another thing, do you guys see how in one, two, three, four, stanza four, that's at the bottom of page 118, how she uses these contrasts, right? And that means she's pointing out um, differences. It, it says to live in the borderlines, I'm sorry, the borderlands mean to put Chile in the borscht, eat whole wheat tortillas, speak Tex-Mex with a Brooklyn accent, um, be stopped by La Migra at the border checkpoint. So you kind of see how, and we'll just stop right there with that little short stanza. Look at her use of contrast here. Um, whole wheat tortillas. What's the contrast in that? Can some, um, speaking Tex-Mex with a Brooklyn accent. Uh, what's the, signi the significance of these differences that she's highlighting here? What do you guys see? Um, I want to say like um, a difference by Spanish and English because um, she's saying um, Tex-Mex uh, with a Brooklyn accent. So I was like maybe uh, yeah, speaking a mix of English and Spanish to an accent. Um, I guess she's referring to um, like Latins, like Latinos. Um, Cause she also mentions All right. Um, I got a little bit of that, but I think I did get most of that, Daniel. So she's attempting to show that even though something may be different or uh, things may be different, they can exist in the same space. It, it, it doesn't have to be borders, metaphorically, that are separating us. So why can't someone speak Tex-Mex um, with a Brooklyn accent. Normally, Tex-Mex is um, relegated to Southwest. That's a Southwest um, area they call, in some cases, um, those living in that area, Texas, um, living on the border, Mexico, but kind of operating um, between the two. Um, I know she refers to herself, the poet um, Azuldan, Anzaldua, she refers to herself as Chicana. So you would think that these particular groups belong in a certain area, right? But by saying speak Tex-Mex with a Brooklyn accent, she's in this use of contrast, she's removing borders. Uh, look at where eat whole wheat tortillas. 
um, what does she mean with whole wheat tortillas? Is it normally um, not commonplace for tortillas to be whole wheat? Like I think her saying whole wheat tortillas here is to kind of show that in, if not assimilating, but in living in these certain areas or you know living in the borderlands, sometimes um, adjustments are made. You don't have to fall within a certain category or operate a particular way. Um, so she does, I, th I believe, use these contrasts to point out that um, these differences can exist in the same place, right? And they can work. Um, all right, one more question. Um, asked you guys to list at least three examples of contrast. We just spelled them out. We just talked about the whole wheat tortillas. What's the contrast here, you guys? What is the statement she's making with eat whole wheat tortillas? Um, or I'll say this, to live in the borderlands mean to put chili in the borscht. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Eat whole wheat tortillas. What is the contrast, the differences that are being emphasized here? Help me out. Like Americans and I don't know, um, Americans and um, different races, I guess. I I see, which which is okay. I mean, that's that's the thing with poetry, and I know we may not have a lot of experience reading poetry. I'm not sure, but the thing with poetry is we can subscribe our own meaning. Like I do know that the author, she definitely has a particular meaning in mind, but as we read, just like with connotation, we attach to um, our reading, our emotion, our imagination. So don't feel you guys like there is a right or wrong way to interpret this, right? Um, I'm really asking because, um, your interpretations based on your own experiences, um, you know, that will, could help open it up for me. Um, I know that um, I may not come from, um, I may not read this the same as someone who connects on a personal level to, um, you know, living life in the borderlands. We've been talking about language. Let's look at her use of language. Do you guys see when she refers to this life, living life in the borderlands, that she uses almost the language of war. Have you guys seen the language that she used? You are the battleground where enemies are kin to each other. Um, you are at home, a stranger. The border disputes have been settled. The volley of shots have shattered the truce. You are wounded, lost in action, dead, fighting back. She's using language that is, um, we can easily associate to warfare, right? She's saying it's a—it's almost like a battle to have to go out and deal with, if not the discrimination, the mistreatment, the stereotypes that a lot of times are attached to, in her case, she's speaking of her um, experience being as someone who's mixed race, someone who is bilingual, right? So she's speaking specific about an experience, but she says it's a battle. She uses the language, um, living in the borderland means you fight hard to resist the goal. Oh, I like this one too, we'll talk about this. Um, living in the borderlands means you fight hard to resist the gold elixir beckoning from the bottle, the pull of the gun barrel, the rope crushing the hollow of your throat. Um, what imagery do you guys get from this particular stanza? One, two, three, four, five. This is at the top of page 119. What imagery do you get from this statement? She talks about language being, um, or living life on the borderlands with language being a battleground. What do you guys see when she says things like, you fight hard to resist the gold elixir beckoning from the bottle, the pull of the gun barrel, the rope crushing the hollow of your throat. What do we see with that? What images come to our minds? Um, two different ones come to my mind. One of them is kind of like just saying, "Okay, I'm I'm just gonna say I'm just okay. w just one race, 
so it's easier to explain to people and the other one is kind of like joining the negative um ideas of like hating a different race because that's what the races do okay i see that i definitely see that um who else wanted to add what as far as what images so benito you pointed out you kind of see um hate there but i'll how about we explore it this way? Um, because she referred to it as a battle, right? Or a battleground, she, she uses language of warfare. She's saying that these experiences of living life on the border, um, a lot of times it can um, have neg I'm sorry, negative impacts on that person. So where it says, you fight hard to resist the gold elixir beckoning from the bottle. A lot of times, people who are discriminated against, um, relegated to the border, like we saw Amy Tan's mother, a lot of times uh, that being that exclusion, it leads to negative manifestation. So she's bringing up other immigrants who perhaps they sought um, comfort in alcohol, in drinking. See, that resist the gold elixir beckoning from the bottle. What about the pull of the gun barrel? A lot of times this uh, exclusion, this uh, racism, this um, xenophobia, a lot of times it leads to negative impact for that individual, such as suicide. So here she is identifying that um, the negative impact of living life this way, it leads to self-hate in some cases, or it leads to a heavy burden, right? Um, that some people, they either drink through, some find ways of um, escape through perhaps the pull of a gun barrel or the rope crushing the hollow of your throat. So she's talking about suicide here. Um, and I don't think she's talking about suicide in that that is so much how she feels, but I think she's talking about suicide in the case that for people who struggle, people who may have lost this war, it ended in suicide in some cases, right? Do you guys see that? Am I stretching? What do you guys think? Now, I only know this because I read her um, an interview that she gave on this and she did kind of point out how um, immigrant, immigrant groups, a lot of times it isn't discussed how the pressures of living life on the borders or having to live up to a certain standard a lot of times they internalize that, it turns into depression. So she said she was talking about the impact that this will have on a particular group. And she mentioned indigenous Native Americans. She mentioned, I believe she mentioned um, Mexican immigrants as well. But a lot of times the way we internalize, the way the world treats us is it can lead to things like um, suicide, et cetera. What about this last stanza, you guys? And I'm gonna put this to rest. I'm gonna leave you alone with Gloria Anzaldua. But let's look at this last stanza. Um, to live in the borderlands means the meal with the razor white teeth wants to shred off your olive red skin, crush out the kernel, your heart, I'm sorry, crush, crush out the kernel, your heart, pound you, pinch you, roll you out, smelling like white bread, but dead. To survive the borderlands, you must live uh, sin fronteras, be a crossroads, okay? So this is how she ends. So she is kind of leaving you guys with a uh, directions, um, not direct, instructions on how to really um, deal with this. To survive, again, she's been using this language of war, right? To survive this, you must live sin fronteras, be a crossroads. What do you think she means when she says you must be be a crossroads? And I know I'm asking you guys to interpret here, but you know, kind of welcome the freedom of interpreting what what you think she means here. There is no right or wrong, right? So what do you guys think she meant where she says in order to survive this this treatment of discrimination, this treatment of exclusion, this treatment where people um, are constantly trying to put you in a box or relegate you um to the outside we saw it all the time with amy tan's mother she would come in contact with people who would disregard her who would just 
ignore her or who would just assume she was ignorant, right? So um, here she's saying, how do we survive this, you know, um, this reality? And she said, you must be a crossroads. What do you guys think she means in you must be a crossroads? What does crossroads mean here? I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get rid of the, the share page. I've kind of gone through my questions, but what do you guys think? Um. I'll try to help out just a little bit where she says, um, to live in the borderland means the meal with the razor white teeth wants to shred off your olive red skin. So society oh. wants to change you in Americanizing you. And she's referring to herself. Keep that in mind. Those who live on the border to really fit in, you have to get rid of who you are, right? The meal with the razor white teeth wants to shred off your olive red skin, crush out the kernel, your heart. So she feels that the heart of who she is, is her Mexican plus um, Indian plus black, um, black um, background. She says that's all of that is at the heart of who she is. So if you are forcing me to, um, you know, deny my language or not speak my language or not utilize the language from my environment, you are rejecting who I am at my essence, right? Um, it says they pound you, pinch you, roll you out, smelling like white bread, but dead. So who you really are has, has, has died, right? It's this replacement of, um, and she's using the term white. So she's saying there's this uh, replacement of a white version of you. And she's saying the way that we survive this, first of all, She's saying you must fight it. You do not assimilate. You do not become, um, you know, what I should say, a carbon copy of what you feel is Americanized or et cetera. But you fight for who you are. You hang on to your heart. Um, so you must live sin fronteras without borders, right? Be a crossroad. Live without borders, be a crossroad. What do you guys think? she means by that? What does this advice mean? I, I think it means that you're going to get used to living in the middle yep. of not being like fully one or the other. Absolutely. And, you, and she's saying get used to that, embrace it, accept it, fight for it, right? And we, we see it pretty much in every part. Her use of both English and Spanish is she is not letting what that part of herself go. It's in everything she does, right? Even in the poetry. Um, and if you, I, I've watched a lot of her speeches, even when she gives speeches to groups, she always includes Spanish. She feels like you're not going to silence that part of me, right? So she says, you must live without borders, be a crossroads. What does it mean to be a crossroads? I know you guys are like, Miss Cole, you've asked me that 30 times. <laughs> but I'm, I'm staying here because she's doing something very intentional um, with this. To survive, you must live without borders, be a crossroads. So we talked already about do people judge you based on the way you speak? And we know that, yes, they do. But in a lot of cases, um, especially I, in... I'm sorry, go ahead, Marissa. I feel like maybe it means like, um, she's a crossroad, like, she's still gonna speak Spanish, like, once in a while, you can't really, like, just make her, like, speak English, English, mm -hmm. and then the border is, she's, like, they want her to speak, like, English, but then the crossroads, like, her bilingualness, right, so I can see that, I can see that, but you, re you really, um, made some good points, the, remove the borders here, oh, I'm sorry, who was about to say something? Okay. Um, when she says remove the borders here, um, you made a good point, Marissa and Benito. She's saying stop trying to fit in. Don't try to 
live up to the expectation that um, you will ever fully be assimilated, right? There are people who look for differences, look to point out differences. And she's saying, don't silence yourself. A lot of times we've talked about how um, whether you have been in a class and a teacher, I've heard some of you told me in class that you have been in classes, you had teachers who told you speak English. Um, if you don't speak English, then you need to go back, you know, to your country, you know, she's saying remove the borders. There is no I either I speak English or Spanish. I am who I am. I'm mixed race. So I do it all. Right. So when she says remove borders, there is no um, what does she call herself? There is no Chicana um, Gloria Anzal Dua. There is no um, American Gloria Anzal Dua. She's saying I'm Gloria Anzal Dua and I incorporate uh, both. I'm not choosing one or the other. That's what she means by we're, we're removing borders. You're not going to put me in a box. You're not going to force me to live um, one or the other. So she's saying she she takes rid of uh, she gets rid of that altogether. In um, all of her books, papers, interviews, she introduces herself as you guys. She has a whole um, list. She calls herself a queer Chicana poet, essayist. So she wants all of her labels. She she includes all of them. So I'm not um, gay or lesbian. I know she's a um, a uh, uh, outspoken activist with that as well. She's saying, I'm not just that. I'm not just a uh, Chicana. I'm not just a poet, you know, so she's removing those um, borders and she does so every single time she engages to speak. But she said, you must be a crossroads. What she means by you must be a crossroads is you're going to have to be the bridge that um, kind of fills in for those who are simply unaware of what their biases, what their prejudices are doing. So she's telling us to be a crossroads is to call people out. Don't just, if a person tells you, um, you know, you know, don't speak English, you're in America speaks, um, I mean, don't just speak Spanish, you're in America speak. She's saying when someone says that to you, rather than be silent or rather than feel that you have to kind of get rid of a part of you. She's saying fight for that. So if someone comes to you and make that uh, particular claim or request, you are a crossroads. So you may have to tell them why that's unnecessary, why I cannot do that, right? Um, again, she's very outspoken um, about this. She feels it is her job to educate those who don't know. So I'm glad we're getting a little bit more information about um, language, not just its overall uses, but how it is used to discriminate, to um, exclude or include. Um, but the main goal in us talking about it is to um, make us, mm, I hope more, a little bit more confident in calling it out, calling it out when you see it, not um, acquiescing. Uh, and what I mean by that is not feeling like that's right. In order for me to be more American, this is what I must do. In order for me to prove that I belong or that I'm included, this is what I should do. She's saying, fight for who you are, all parts of you. So that's what Be Across Worlds are. And I think if we're more visual, I'm sorry, if we're more intentional with that, if people can see that, it will encourage others to speak up as well, right? Um, I didn't get a chance to get to the... Um, Jose Olivares speech, Citizen Illegal. But I, I am gonna post it for you guys, but let me just throw in this little tidbit about that. Um, he is using the word citizen and illegal as um, labels. So he's telling a story about um, his parents. His parents are Mexican immigrants. He is first generation Mexican American. Um, so he says, when he says, whenever people ask me where I'm from and I say my parents are from Mexico, he will put in parentheses next to each stanza, illegal. And then when he says, I was born in Chicago, citizen. He's saying that anytime he interacts with people, they feel the need to put him in a box and it's constant. 
if he tells someone that his parents are from Mexico, he said the natural next question he will get is, do you speaking, you know, start talking about language. So there's only this one dimensional association that people have been making, um, especially lately in the political climate that we've been in. Don't even get me talking about um, the current administration and how they've really fed a lot of um, the issues that we even talk about with language discrimination. Um, while some people feel that it is a matter of life and death to really belong or be um, included, uh, so I'll post that for you guys. I'll allow you guys to read it based on what we've talked about with connotation and denotation. And I plan to set up a discussion board for you guys to kind of throw out your ideas about it. So let me ask this. Are you guys comfortable with using Brightspace discussion board um, capability? Have, have we ever used discussion board on Brightspace? Do you guys have any um, experience? I don't think we have. Okay. No, I don't think so. No. no. Okay. I'm sorry, say it again, Jocelyn. No, I don't think so. Okay. Um, when I set it up, I'll give directions on Brightspace, but I do want you guys to take a look at that poem um, in that where Gloria Anzo Dua will use both English and Spanish to kind of identify the parts of her. Um, the Chicago poet, um, Jose Olivares, he uses subtle language such as citizen and I'm sorry such as citizen and illegal to point out uh, the discrimination he gets a lot um, when using labels such as you know Mexican American um, you know things like that so I'll lay that out we'll talk about it um, before we get out of here because I know I've gone over forgive me but let me show you guys this really quickly and I'll reiterate it on bright space but uh, in efforts to get you guys out of here Next week is spring break. Uh, again, I told you guys we don't check in next week, but uh, I want to again highlight uh, two things that you guys will be focusing on over spring break. Uh, well, two assignments we haven't completed as of yet. If you haven't done your journal, you guys still have time. How are you influenced or shaped by your environment? Um, Try to answer that. I want you guys to really think about that question. Try to answer it as critically as possible. Don't try to be so surface in your responses with this, but how are you influenced or shaped by your environment? So I want you guys to think about where you are, whether that's Chicago, whether that is your neighborhoods. Um, but in asking how are you influenced or shaped, think about behaviors that may be shaped or influenced. Think about your language, vocabulary that may be shaped or influenced, um, but try to think a little bit deeper, not just um, are you influenced, but in what ways? And I'll give you guys a quick example with this. Um, I was talking to my son about, I'll say his demeanor, how he carries himself, right? And I tell him sometimes you come off a little bit mean or that you may be angry. And he told me that Ma, to kind of, travel in Chicago, for me to travel outside the house, I have to kind of portray that I am tough, that I'm alert, that, you know, um, I'm not easily uh, intimidated. He said, because if not, then he would get tested outside of the home. Do you guys agree with that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So that is a way that he has been shaped or influenced by his environment. Um, this kind of this portraying, if you will, that he's tough or that he's not to be messed with. That is a survival technique. Um, so that again is an example of how one is shaped or influenced. Another way, um, just an example for this is I, when I first moved here, because you guys know I'm a transplant, when I first moved here from Oklahoma, I was told a lot that I speak country, you know, the North and South thing. So I was influenced uh, to kind of change my long, you know, country draw, how I may roll out my ALs or my a ERs or ARs is AH, you know, those types of things. So I was influenced or shaped by my environment to uh, make these language adjustments. So I want you guys to really think about that question when you respond to it in your journals. 
Um, one more quick thing before we go. Do you guys remember the essay portion of the practice CRT? Do you guys remember the uh, in-class essay portion of the practice CRT? Yes. Yeah. I think when I asked yeah. you guys, um, what did you think about the CRT? Is it true to assume that you guys found the essay writing portion somewhat difficult under a time setting? Yes. Okay. Okay. I definitely want to work more on that. So if you guys will look here at the bottom where it says number seven, um, there is a essay prompt that I want over spring break for you guys to practice responding to it um, in a similar fashion than what you would do if we were in an in, in class writing format. So I want you to think about what do you do first when you are introduced to a um, essay topic? What are those steps? And um, I want you guys to kind of be mindful of that because when we talk again, not next week, but the week after, I want to know what were your steps in kind of getting through this um, short paper assignment. So look here. I say five paragraphs. I'm changing this to three paragraphs. So you guys see me in real time. This is three. And then we'll build it up from there. But let's say, what do you think should be done to end language discrimination? Um, a big part in me assessing whether or not you guys are college ready will be your ability to argue or let me say assert or defend your position on a topic okay so anytime you see the words should what should someone do that's a clear indicator that you are writing an argument essay they want to know your argument as to what is the best way um, and anytime we deal with an argument, we're looking at uh, you using evidence to support and develop that. So think about this question. What do you think should be done to end language discrimination? We've talked about it uh, in various different ways. We saw how Amy Tan Mothers experienced it. We looked at um, Gloria Anzal Dua's poem. We looked at do we judge people based on how they speak. With all of that information, what do you guys think? should be done to end language discrimination. So a couple things I want you guys to keep in mind as you complete this assignment over spring break. You guys maybe can even do it this weekend if you had something planned for next week. But first things first, in an essay writing assignment, whether it's in class or for a paper, you always want to answer the question. So just think about your response to the question. Use a three paragraph format. Uh, still try to stick to introduction body paragraph conclusion but i want to see what you guys come back with um, when we meet up again uh, monday let me pull up that actual date and i'll tell you guys this on bright space as well so we'll see each other again on monday april 13th oh no that can't be right that's right yep april 13th oh wow Miss <laughs> um so in that amount of time when we see each other again on that Monday, you guys bring in your drafts for this particular question, okay? What do you think should be done to end language discrimination? And we'll pick up our um, instruction from there. All right, so how do you guys feel about that? Only homework you guys have to work on is this response paper. But I do want you to practice um, being mindful of the process that you take from start to finish and also focusing on answering the question. So um, are you guys kind of clear on what we're doing in our absence? Yes. yes. All right, good. I won't. I'll leave you alone. I'll get you guys off of here. I'll reiterate all of this on Brightspace. Um, something else to check. Make sure you guys are checking Brightspace regularly. I may also upload some um, work for you guys to do inside with your grammar workbook. Okay, so um, pay attention to Brightspace. I'll uh, post this question, but know that you guys are coming back Monday, April 13th with writing prepared. Okay, uh, it says here that you guys should try to type the assignment. Do your best to type the assignment. Um, three paragraphs, answer the question, stick to the format, and we'll talk about it on Monday. Um, and if you guys have any questions, I will be available next week for office hours so i'll lay that out as well um but other than that
Um, I have yeah. a question. Sure, go ahead. Um, for the journal assignment, I checked it in, but is it possible that I could redo it? Sure, sure. So, um, when you turned it in, you sent an email. So here's what you'll do. When you resubmit it, um, put maybe in the subject bar, uh, updated journal. And then that way I'll know to disregard any previous, this is the current journal entry, okay? Okay. Okay. All right, good. If you guys do have any questions, you can always email me. Go ahead, get off of here. Enjoy the rest of your day. Try to do something to enjoy your spring break, but make sure you guys um, get that response paper done. Okay? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Cole. All right. No worries, you guys. Um, be well. Stay healthy. See you guys you April 13th. You too. Oh, I'm sorry, Daniel. I'm sorry, Daniel. Go ahead. <laughs> stay safe and healthy as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye. All right, you guys. And if there's anybody who needed to stay over with questions, I'll, I'll sit here for a minute. Ms. Cole. Yes, hey, Marissa. Hi, um, I was gonna ask you, so you said do a three, sorry about the bird. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it just started doing that. Anyways, um, I was saying for the essay, for the response huh? question, remember, do we have to do three paragraphs and then send that to you? Yeah, three paragraphs. Um, you can send it to me. Yeah. That's a good question. I, I just wanted you guys to come with it to class on Monday, but I think I am going to add a um, due date. Uh, so yeah, you'll be sending that in to me, Marissa. Yes. Yeah, sorry for the confusion. And, mm -hmm. and then after spring break, we should already be in school, right? I'm sorry, like say it one more time. You said after spring break, you should already be what? In school? Oh, girl, I don't think so. Um, they <laughs> sent the email that... Um, to us anyway, to prepare to be on remote learning, so this online learning for the rest of the semester. So that's what they've told us. Really? Yes, I know. I feel the same way. Yeah, they did. Summer class is supposed to be on um, online too. Yeah, yeah. They sent the word that we are, we should prepare that all summer classes are online as well. So are we going to have to stay home for like a year or something? I certainly hope not. I know that on the news, they have been saying- April 30th? That, yeah, they said April 30th, but I honestly, realistically, I will say, it may be anywhere from another two weeks to another month for the um, social distancing um, guidelines, so. And everything closed and everything, right? Yes, it has that's, been. Well, that's bogus, kind of, to me, because, like, my birthday's coming, and I'm, like, oh, finally man. turning 21, and oh, then I can't even go to the bar or nothing. Oh, Marissa, I, I <laughs> certainly understand. I, I know I have people who were planning to go to prom next month and graduation, yeah. so everybody is like, what do I do now? We're gonna A lot of people are just getting diplomas. Yes, yes. That's bogus, too. Um, so... We're gonna have to get creative in how how you celebrate your birthday. I don't know, girl. I don't know what what to do exactly, but I know that people have been having kind of like those solitary parties. Have you guys kind of seen what's been yeah. on Instagram? Yeah, I've seen people celebrating birthday parties um, through phone, uh, social media. I've seen people mm -hmm. celebrating um, it, not just the birthday parties. Um, Did you hear about that little girl? on on the news where um she couldn't go anywhere for her birthday so they like brought elsa on the phone and yeah. Elsa was being happy yeah. birthday yeah elsa it's been a lot of cases like that so i would say get um creative um marissa look 21 you can still turn up look we'll just have to figure out how <laughs> but yeah that that, that is kind of where we are now so i would say plan for if not two weeks um i'll say two weeks to a month for us okay. to be social distancing, kind of stay at home order. Okay. Okay. That's it. That's all. That all right. Have. If you have any other questions, email me. Okay. Ms. Cole, I have a question. Okay. Yeah, sure, Nina. How's it going? Um, are you going to post this video on YouTube? Oh, snap, girl. Yes. I'm glad you said that. Let me.